guys so much. Thank you for uh, coming out. Thank you to Reed College for bringing me out. Thank you to Tamara. Um, and this is just a really uh, exciting opportunity for me. Um, is this functioning? The mic seems to be working. Okay, good. Um, all right, so I'm going to, I wander a little bit, so I'm going to be wandering a little bit as I talk. Uh, what? Kind of first, uh, first thing to say is, or two things I guess I should say about uh, my biography and the introduction. So I, I pondered long and hard whether I wanted to add in the correct adjective for the Chinese, which is classical Chinese. So I, I should have said ancient Greek and classical Chinese thought. But because I was already saying ancient Greek, I didn't want to have another adjective in there. And so, anyway, Thinking so, about your writing, which is what all of my students have done recently. Right. So I, but you caught me there, right? I was technically, I was not as accurate in my biography. My own biography is fake news, I guess is what I'm here to tell you. Um, the other thing I, I guess I want to say at the beginning, uh, if Numenoid Athena, the post of human origins of the West and the Xenopolis to come, so this is just like for many of your students. So this is kind of a how-to and what not to do for a title for a presentation. Because it's got about eight words in there that no one knows what they are, right? So this is just not this is just not good strategy on my part, not, not good rhetoric. Uh, I'm gonna get to talking about what the humanoid is, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about post-human to fill in that blank if you don't have a sense of what post-humanism is. And Xenopolis, I'm also gonna talk about. If you don't know who Athena is, I cannot help you. So I'm, I'm not, well, I, I can actually, but I'm, I'm not going to give you that as a part of the introduction. Um, okay, so I do have to start with a confession. I have, I have a troubled history with Reed, and I don't even think Tamara knows of this. My troubled history is that in 1985, I received, because of my PSAT score, I received a letter, because this is how institutions like Reed did things back in the day, uh, a letter to, hey, come, like, apply, because, you know, you've got a good PSAT score. Do they still do the PSAT? Yeah, okay. Good. I'm up in Canada now, so none, I mean, I'm in America, I'm both American and Canadian, but I started out as American, but none of my students have to take SAT, so whatever it is, the Canadians will do that. Um, so I received a letter, and I was, let's say I would not have been a good fit for Reed. The evidence for this is that I ended up going to USC, the University of Southern California. And I think the student body population at USC is probably not that similar to Reed. I could be totally wrong about that. I didn't join a fraternity when I went to USC, but anyway. But so I got this letter from Reed, and it had a, a weird face. I don't even, I don't know what the exact face is. I did some Googling, some research while I was here. And the closest I can figure is that this image, which is on Elliott Hall, right, this gargoyle, I believe it was this image, it was a stylized version of this that was placed on the stationery that was sent to me. So I thought this image was so strange, and again, I'm not totally sure that this is it because I googled 1985 admission materials or solicitation materials from Reed College, and surprisingly that's not something you can find in the Google, or at least it didn't come up when I googled it. So I think it's this. Anyway. So, but I actually wrote a letter back to Reed, basically a sarcastic, because I was a, just a sarcastic asshole, I still am, but I mean, I was especially that uh, in 1985, and I, I wrote some snarky letter to Reed the admissions, like, what's going on with this face, or something like that. Of course, no one responded to my letter. So I guess I just wanted to say, uh, if anyone is here from the admissions office from 1985, 1986, I'm sorry if I offended you, uh, and Hopefully, we can just make good with you know, the past, and I've tried to do better with my life. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I really think that that is the thing. I don't know. It, it seems it doesn't get used by reading in the course, sort of correspondence anymore. Maybe, actually, maybe my letter had some influence in this. So, I thought, well, we're, we're turning off people, so let's change that. No, I'm sure that's not it. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about parasites and parasitism. And it seems that uh, there's some movie that you might have heard of uh, that is uh, a little, it's, parasites are a little trendy right now. So this, this is actually related, I don't have a, a nuanced story about parasite, but it is, there is some relation and if you want to get into this in a Q&A, we can. Um, my parasite, my, uh, my hero for, for my story, the ignumenoid of my title, comes from uh, this kind of wasp. So polysphincter good, good Freundy is uh, this specific kind 
kind of wasp, but this is a parasitic wasp. Um, and specifically, it's from the Eumonidae uh, superfamily. I think. So there are 80,000 species. Uh, yeah, I say 80,000, it's not 80,000 individuals, but 80,000 species. This is an extraordinarily successful for uh, organism. And the parasitic wasps, uh, I'll get into a little bit about what they do, but just to get the, um, to get to the punchline is what they do is they lay eggs in spiders, they paralyze spiders, put, the, put their eggs inside of them, and then sometimes the spider functions normally, sometimes the spider remains paralyzed, and then the little larva eats its way out of the spider, killing the spider. Um, parasitic wasps, be it pneumonidae, were so disturbing that uh, someone, uh, a biologist, uh, as you would think, in order to cruelty is Charles Darwin. Darwin has a letter in which he says, I can't believe that a benevolent God would have created these creatures. They are so horrifying. And you know, this is the man who developed natural selection, or popularized uh, natural selection. He, he thought these were terrible, terrible, horrifying organisms. Um, so this is going to be one of my hero figures. This is my other parasite figure. Now, most of you are too young to have been alive. When this movie came out, the movie Alien, this is the famed face cover parasite from the movie Alien. The movie Alien drew on the real life parasitic wasp as its inspiration, so that is part of the actual backstory. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about paras real parasitic wasps and a little bit about the metaphorical use of parasitism uh, that occurs in the movie Alien, which is drawing on parasitic wasps. Um, there is actually a meme about free hug with you know, these t-shirts, like free hugs, because it's a face hugger, and it, it kills people, right? This, the people don't survive when you, when you get exposed to it this way. So um, this, I'm, this is my bad attempt at a graphic that I constructed myself. So again, so many levels of like bad things and what not to do, but I'm gonna, I'm putting this in pictorial form and I'm gonna, by the end I hope I can actually explain what I have going on up here. Um, from the movie Alien, so just, just to give the, the very briefest layout. So in the movie Alien you have this person, Cain, who was uh, infected with uh, a parasite by the face hugger. He actually uh, thinks everything is fine and he's, uh, he's okay, and so he's eating a meal. And then there's a very famous scene in which he begins coughing and then spasming, and then his, uh, the crewmates hold him down, and then eventually the little uh, alien is going to pop out of his chest. That alien is called the chest burster. So there's the face hunger alien and the chest burster. They work together. Um, and then that alien will grow into the, the chest burster grows into the larger, nasty looking um, alien, uh, famous. Uh, from the movie and from some of the other movies, and Alien vs. Predator, and which is a terrible series, but we're not going to get into that. Um, sorry if there are any Alien vs. Predator stands here. We can we can have an about that. Um, so what I what I want to say is just in, in terms of the kind of metaphorical setup here is anthropocentrism is my my target, my opponent, the um, the way of life, or you could think anthropocentric civilization is what I am interested in destroying, putting an end to. So I want post-humanism, or I see post-humanism as a kind of parasite that can be inserted into uh, anthropocentric civilization and can sort of explode it from the inside out. Um, the violent imagery is, we can talk about this, but it's I, I intentionally using violent imagery. Um, the, the reason that I have Western Civ up there in the corner is that figure there, that person in the movie, is a, an android uh, who is actually in secret collusion with the artificial intelligence that runs the spaceship they're on, and they have colluded to actually allow the parasite to be in this person. So it appears that he's actually concerned or worried. He's actually not. He's actually working with the parasite. So. For me, that uh, Western Civ, I actually should have titled it slightly differently, those are the texts of Western civilization that I think can actually be used in conjunction with post-humanism to explode anthropocentric civilization from the inside. Okay, so that's a kind of graphic representation. It's graphic in multiple senses, I guess, of what I see uh, going on here, or sort of what my task is. And 
it's all confusing right now, and for many of you who haven't seen the Alien, understand why, why you even bother with this. Anyway, it, it helps if you've seen it. If you haven't, I, I think it'll, I'll, I'll get around to making it clear if, um, by the end. Okay, so now let me get to some slides that have actual words on them, or other words. Um, so for me, as I've said, this, the theory that I want to do is very much in response to a problem in the world, uh, or set a series of problems in the world that are now, um, I, I, I think, characterized by the classification of this period in the Earth's geology and climate, the period of the Anthropocene, right? So now when human beings have fundamentally taken over in such a way that we are altering planet, we, we are altering things in, in a planetary way. Um, there are multiple aspects to this, the sixth grade extinction, so the massive uh, kinds of uh, die-offs that we are engendering, that uh, anthropocentric industrial civilization is engendering, um, the animal exploitation that goes hand in hand with that, so in terms of animal agriculture, which is one of the primary causes of climate change. Now, of course, it's not the only cause of climate change, but it's about 25 or 30% of Gases are directly linked to the production of animal uh, animals that were consumed um, by human beings. Uh, and climate change, of course, is a problem whether or not it's related to animal exploitation. But it's, so all of these things coming together. Um, for me, this means that theory has a deadline. Now I'm riffing on Nick Bostrom's you know, transhumanist work where he talks about philosophy with a deadline. He's worried about the creation of a superintelligence that, that can uh, that will possibly cause an extinction of any human beings. Um, that's also a problem that I'm worried about, but I'm, I'm worried about us reaching a tipping point where we can no longer win. We've already reached sort of minor tipping points. Um, but uh, we are soon approaching a, a point where there won't be a return to, right? The extinctions are already occurring, the animal exploitation. All of those deaths are constantly occurring. Uh, but with climate change and the extinction events, where we have to act you know, in the next 10, 20 years. This is not, this is not just a kind of um, abstract thought exercise for me. So this very much, what I'm doing very much comes out of a concern with um, this reality. So one approach, there are many approaches one can take to this um, sort of crisis. My approach is indebted to something called biomimesis. Just out of curiosity, how many folks have come across this term? So a few. Um, so basically the idea across a variety of fields, um, architecture, engineering, um, design, uh, also philosophy, um, the idea is to look at so-called natural systems to see how animals, plants, insects, what have you, do certain things and then learn from those and actually imitate. So we, we imitate natural processes, uh, learn from natural processes in order to actually develop more sophisticated um, sort of smart responses to whatever the problem may be. Um, so, one way of thinking about biomimesis or applying this to political theory is using that as a kind of counter move to try to take lessons from certain kinds of animals, parasitic wasps for me, uh, and mobilize those, use those as tools, sort of learn from the animals as exemplars and then apply lessons, if you will, or methods to solving human problems or human created problems. So for me, it's it's going to be parasitism as a kind of interpretive method and as a kind of politics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how those interpretations work. Um, so for me, I am interested in thinking about animals as bearers of rights. And so I'm, I'm interested in um, extending not just ethical, well, ethical and polit political consideration to non Animals, which might mean something like animal rights. There are lots of ways of filling that in specifically. I'm not going to be talking about the specifics tonight. Um, what I'm specifically talking about is more of that uh, these animal systems as inspiration for how to actually act and alter our human dominated world. Um, it's in the service of kind of animal rights or something like that program, um, but that's not, you know, that's not the bulk of um, and so for me, the question then becomes, is, is there value in going 
back to the past in order to alter our future. So in terms of getting to that non-extinction event future, where we're not extinguishing other beings and also not extinguishing ourselves, uh, is perhaps the best way to go back to the past, to rethink, repurpose, reuse, rewire our past traditions, the traditions that we think say one particular kind of thing, that humans are superior, uh, that humans are sort of above uh, all other creatures. This is kind of one of the core lessons that um, is taught again and again and again in the humanist tradition in Western Civ type uh, courses, not just in Western Civ type courses, but all throughout. Um, and so I'm interested in, in going back and hacking our past, and I think there's actually good reason to say that that's a, a, a powerful method for actually altering our future. Okay, so my humanoid Athena. Um, so I'm riffing, I've got the little, I'll put it as a hashtag, I don't know why, but. Um, so there's a text called Black Athena, written by Martin Bernal uh, uh, quite a number of years ago, that uh, attempted a, a really fundamental rethinking of ancient Greek political thought to say, this has been taught as a kind of Eurocentric, um, you know, triumph of white European civilization sort of past, that that's the way that people presented um, the Greeks. And in particular, it's the Germans who kind of start this. Um, I'm mainly German myself, so I'm not trying to other the Germans here, but there's a lot of problematic German scholarship in the 1700s and 1800s that does this thing that Bernal was talking about. So the Germans say, it's Germany and Greece are the tied together. We have this essential understanding of what the you know what human life is, and we have a kind of philosophic way of understanding what it is to be human and the ties of the Germans and the Greeks together, which is a lot of it is just crazy. A lot of what the Germans in the 1700s were saying is kind of crazy. Anyway, so Martin Bernal uh, tries to show how, in fact, a whole bunch of the stuff that's taken to be exemplary of Greek political thought or Greek philosophy more generally was drawn from Egypt and uh, was drawn from uh, basically African sources. So he was trying to say, Athena, whom you take, you ordinary folks, scholars especially, you take to be a representative of, kind of white European culture, is actually black, right? It was actually drawing on African sources. So Greece is actually dead to Africa, not any other way around. Um, so for me, I'm, uh, I'm you know, sort of inspired by that approach. I'm not literally going to be telling you much about Athena tonight, but it's a way of rethinking, OK, what are the Greeks? right? And so for me, I want to turn the Greeks into parasitic stinging wasps. right? So this is, this is my wasp, Athena. Um, if any of you are, if any of you are uh, classically uh, trained, you might say, oh, but those images are actually bee goddesses from Rhodes in the seventh century BCE. They're not wasps. So we all can just keep quiet if you're going to say that. I don't want to hear that. I couldn't find any nifty little wasp goddesses from ancient Greece. So I'm using bees, and bees are not wasps, and I know that. Um, but anyway, but this is close enough. It's close enough for me. You're, you're not, don't tell anybody about it. We're not live tweeting. No one's live tweeting this, right? So this is what we're fine. No, but there may be someone in the audience who knows the difference. So I'm glad you well, said that. Well, so I'm just, I, so I know I'm, I'm creatively reinterpreting these images. Bee goddesses, and I'm turning them into wasp goddesses. But I know that they're not actually. Okay. So now I did I did not create this. Um, so one possible response. Now I know many of you have a fondness for classical texts. So this might not be your response. But if you have seen any of the things that have been going on over the last four or five years, you would know that most of the time when people go back with enthusiasm to the ancient Greeks, and when they think there's a politics there, they're doing this, right? This is an actual, you know, this is something I lifted from the internet, but this is, this is an actual meme, right? The idea is that the ancient Greeks are exemplary of a kind of heroic, white, masculinist, European um, civilization, European culture, um, of course, uh, not trivially, many people who are essentially white nationalists today 
claim, well, we're not really white nationalists, we're just defenders of Western civilization, which is white European civilization, right? So there's a whole discourse around uh, sort of repurposing white supremacy and tying it to the Greeks and tying it to, um, to the, tying it to Western civ. So one might think, it, it, you know, if you were skeptically inclined, you would say, well, you know, great that you want to challenge anthropocentric uh, civilization and climate change and all that, but you know, like maybe the Spartan dudes are not, maybe they're not the way to go, right? Um, and and that would be um, that would be a reasonable um, criticism. I think, however, that you know, and as as many of you know, obviously. There are many different ways of interpreting the Greeks. Uh, so the Molon Lave folks, uh, the, that, that's the uh, quotation from the Spartans, right? come and take them, right? the response to the Persian king who, want, who wants, wants them to hand in their weapons, you know, come and take them from us, right? It's the, the real, sort of, again, that's, uh, that's sort of masculinist. Yeah, you, you want my sword, you know, come and take it from my cold dead hands, uh, sort of thing. Um, well, of course, we know that that's not all that's going on. Thought. Um, Don Zuckerberg, I just wanted to mention, did, just in terms of popularizing alternative approaches um, to Western Civ, uh, she's got a, a, she's the editor of a journal called uh, Eidolon. Does that, any, any of you know of this at all? It's nifty, it's it's nice, you might, she's also the sister of Mark Zuckerberg, not that, that doesn't validate her, but it's just, if this sounds familiar to you yet, yeah, it's, it's because she is from the famous, famous family. Um, but she has a, she she has a PhD in classics from Princeton, uh, does really interesting work. She's got a, a book called Not All Dead White Men, which ties together misogyny on the internet, the, this kind of uh, appropriation of the Greeks by misogynists, uh, and then is you know, critiquing them. But it's, it's a kind of public intellectual work that she's doing, which is really interesting and important. Anyway, so lots of folks obviously doing different things with the Greeks. Um, but so, if it's the case that we know that the sort of this is Sparta brand of um, uh, you know, heroic masculinist um, Greek thinking, if we know that that's basically a mythologized version of the past, then uh, maybe it isn't too far to then move sort of another step farther to, to say, look, if we know that there's this kind of cultural construction of the Greeks, um, Maybe this whole idea of us being a part of this thing called Western culture, Western civilization, uh, this is also a construction, right? It's a construction to think of ourselves in a, this particular tradition in which uh, humanity is defined, or we, we are defined as Western through being uh, kind of rational, autonomous, and human in contradistinction to, uh, to all the rest of, uh, of the cosmos. Um, the rational autonomous human thing and challenging that is that's the, the post-human, that's post-human theory. Post-human theory does a lot of different things, but at its core, it basically says we have been sold a false bill of goods in, by those who say that humans are distinguished from the rest of the non-human world. Well, or even that human and non-human are the fundamental terms of distinction and that that distinction is based on humanity's largely exclusive possession of rationality and autonomy. So the post-humanists are not, the post-humanism is a gigantic tent. You have transhumanists who want us to upload our consciousness. Um, you have uh, critical animal studies folks. You have critical plant studies folks. Um, uh, you have uh, um, deep ecologists. It, you can go many, many different ways in posthumanism, but basically all of them are challenging in one way or another the idea that humanity's rationality and autonomy are the, the linchpin of what makes us important and different uh, in the cosmos, and that those are the things to mobilize around. So the posthumanists, it's, it's really just challenging that. Okay, so I'm interested in what I'm calling here a future xenopolis. You can also call it a zoopolis, so I have a mammal polity. Um, I like the term Xenopolis because, well, because I like to talk about ancient Greek things, but uh, because of these 
the, the way that this term brings in to the political, the, the notion that we have to foreground a connection with strangeness, with otherness, uh, with the foreign. Also, Xenos is both guest and host. You know, lots of these Greek terms have basically polar opposite meanings. Uh, guest and host use the same term for that. Um, so the idea is to, to think about a polity or construct a polity in which encountering otherness, strangeness, and difference is centered as what the political is rather than the political being about what is at home, what is familiar, what, you know, that sort of thing. The idea of only having a polity with those we, we share a, you know, a bunch of common traits and then other polities are sort of excluded from that. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the details. We can get to this in the q and or just so, but I, I don't want to talk a lot about the details. So I'm, I'm really trying to get to the how-to through this method of well, at least one one part of it is reinterpreting our past in order to sort of partially think our way out in order to act differently um, in the present. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about my parasite, my parasite heroes and heroines. Um, so this shows basically the difference between what the, the spider that tends to be the target of the polysynthetic. What that spider's web normally looks like, and then what the spider does once the um, once the larva is inserted into the spider. Now, they're eighty thousand pneumonidae, so they do there are a bunch of different specific things that they do with the spiders. But frequently, what they turn the spiders into is zombies, and so this is an example of that. So the spider, in this case, actually it stays alive. It's got the little egg that's turning into a larva inside of it, and its brain gets hijacked by the larva. The larva actually controls the spider and gets the spider to build a different kind of web. It has to build a different kind of web, in this case, because the normal web of that spider would not support the growing weight of the larva inside the spider, so it has, it has to build a web that can support it, and so it has to be a little different. So the little larva gets the spider to build a web that is more accommodating to the, the growth in weight of that combined entity, spider and wasp larva. Now, it's not going to end well for the spider, at least if, if you think that being eaten from the inside out uh, is a bad result. Darwin certainly didn't like this. Um, but that is what is going to happen to the spider. Um, so I have three, uh, three parts of this process that I identify uh, in terms of what the spider does, or sorry, in terms of what the wasp does, and then what I think we can learn from that. So insertion, imitation, and rewiring, or hacking is the final one. Use, uh, use the other term if you want. Um, so the spider, sorry, Spider first. The wasp, by inserting, so the, you know, lots of places that one could put one's egg if one is a wasp. Okay, so why place that egg inside the spider? Uh, I'm calling that a confession of weakness. At least this is the, the lesson that I want to draw from that. So it's a hostile world. World is going to try to eat your little egg, your little wasp egg larva. Nice if you can find a warm place for your larva. Nice if you can find a place that is protected where your larva can grow safely for a time and then you know, come out into the light of day as a, a fully fledged uh, wasp and go find some other spiders. Um, but I think this, this operation of the insertion is a kind of confession of weakness. And this is the part of what I want to adopt um, more explicitly. It's a confession of weakness to say, and I think it's a good thing to say, look, as activists or as scholars, as folks who are concerned with the challenge of the Anthropocene, it's, it's hard, right? It's trying to turn around a gigantic ship that is traveling very quickly in one direction, and as individuals, it's very difficult to think about how we can actually do anything about it. So 
one way to start is to admit that we don't actually have much power in ourselves as individuals. And it's really nice if we can find a place to sit, to stay, to live, and to grow inside of something else that's actually already there. Um, and, and, we'll, and we'll keep us uh, safe for a little while. Uh, and then that's the, that's the place from which we can try to make change. So, I mean, I guess you could also say that this is as simple as sometimes it's easier to make change from within than you know, sort of standing outside the battlements. Uh, the inside of the confession of weakness for me is I don't think we need, in order to change anthropocentric civilization, we don't need to say, all of anthropocentric civilization sucks, and so let's come up with some totally new ways of thinking that no one's ever thought before. Not that there's anything wrong with that as a strategy. I'm polymorphously perverse about strategy. If you can find a strategy and you try it, it works great. But it's also useful to instead, and I think it may be more useful to instead say, hey, let's just try to insert ourselves into these texts and traditions that we are already a part of and try to take those over from within. So I don't need someone other than Plato. If everybody wants to talk about Plato and the importance of whomever, Plato or Hobbes or whatever, the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or whatever, instead of finding a new document to say, hey, these other documents are wrong, let's do something else, let's find another way of living, you can just do the other thing, which is to say, no, these documents don't actually mean the things that you mean. Oh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. That's my rewiring. But this is where the confession of weakness leads to. Um, Patricia Hill Collins also talks about, another uh, intersectional uh, scholar, also talks about the importance of the place of being the one who is neither inside nor outside. So it's kind of the stranger within. So she's specifically talking about um, African-American domestic workers within white households and the way that they had an outsider's perspective on what was going on in those families. But they weren't totally outside, they were inside, but of course they weren't inside in the, in the fundamental sense because they were still seen as kind of outsiders. So they were both inside and outside. So this is another way of thinking about what I think that parasite Marvin is doing and what we can be doing in terms of how we are interpreting texts. Um, the imitation, I, don't, I won't say much on that other than to say I've already talked about the, the way that the, there's this chemical uh, manipulation, but the parasite has to figure out the codes of the, uh, the uh, body that it is going to be rewiring. So it needs to know what those chemicals do in order to alter those. Now it's doing this without thinking about it, right? This is just a little arm, but it does this stuff. Um, but in a way, this is what I'm calling the faith of the parasite, uh, and this, I think, text today. So it is important to understand some of the codes and conventions of these texts, just to, uh, as we would understand the, the, how the uh, parasite understands that spider's body. Um, so there's a certain faithfulness that one has to have to sort of knowing how these things work. So how do these texts work and um, how does one read the text in a certain basic way and how, how have they functioned in a certain articulation of Western civilization. Uh, important to learn those things, but it is in order to alter them. It is not to be faithful to them as a kind of fundamental scripture that knows no challenge or change. It's precisely to, and again, the hacker metaphor here is, is most apt. Um, you know, if you're going to be Edward Snowden, you can only get to be Edward Snowden if you actually understand how the coding works, right? That, that is literally how you have to do it. Um, so in the way that the parasite will say, Hey, guess what, spider? You thought all along that your DNA put you in this world to do thus and such and to reproduce. Guess what? I have a different interpretation for your DNA. I'm going to take this over. I'm going to make it speak for me. It, it did speak well in some ways for you. I have a different spin on it. That is what the parasite does. This is what the hacker does. Um, this is what we can do in terms of interpreting these uh, texts. So, I want to give you just a brief example of how I do this, how this sort of plays out, this insertion, imitation, and rewiring. Now, I have a couple of different um, texts that I've worked a lot with, and that I've published some, and, and have not published um, some others. So I'm going to talk to you today, tonight, a little bit 
about what I did with Homer's Iliad uh, and the way that I see the virtues of beastliness or cruelty or sort of predatory animality um, cashed out there. Um, but just, just to, to throw this out there, I have also done some work uh, with Plato uh, on Plato's kind of bit, sort of semi-secret vegetarian commitments. Um, there's also some interesting ways in which Plato ties in and can connect with uh, the Afrofuturist tradition, which looks at uh, kind of stories of humans as aliens, uh, or in particular, thinking of African Americans as aliens um, in the United States as like like literally as aliens right, right from outer space. And you know, Sun Ra, George Clinton, there's a whole there's a whole set in Janelle uh, all kinds of interesting things uh, in, in um, Afrofuturist music. Uh, there's some interesting resonances with with Afrofuturism and the stories of um, humanity's alienness that come out of Plato and the Taimiya specifically. Um, and then Aristotle's politics. Um, Aristotle is often thought to distinguish human beings from other creatures uh, precisely by humanity's politicalness. I don't know if politicalness is a word, but anyway. Um, but in his biological treatises, guess what? Wasps, bees, and cranes are the other, uh, and ants are uh, are the other political creatures. Humanity is not distinguished from non-human animals. In fact, it's wasps, conveniently enough for me, because I like wasps. Uh, wasps also have a politics. Anyway, so I've got some stuff with that, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the parasitic Iliad. Now, I'm guessing Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus are not a part of the standard read curriculum. Would I be, would I be correct in the comments? Oh, I bet lots of these folks have, have dipped their toes into it, but not in intro to political theory. Yeah, that's true. Uh, no, and so I'm, I'm just going to say, so Deleuze, Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus is my posthumanist text that I'm using to interpret Homer's Iliad. Um, and basically, the coming animal is one of the core concepts for Deleuze and Guattari. And it, it's hard to summarize this, but basically, it's thinking about human beings as not rational or autonomous or any of those things. So they're really trying to shatter all of the assumptions of humanism and to think about humanity as in flux. And so becoming, there's lots of different becomings that they talk about, becoming animal, becoming music, becoming grass, becoming imperceptible. But becoming an animal is one of the key things. And for them, it's not about um, imitating as it is about actually transforming ourselves. And so they see all kinds of ways that human beings transform themselves where they're not trying to think, oh, I want to act like a monkey act like a horse, but they, you, you actually become that animal in some way. Not, perhaps not literally, but also not metaphorically. Um, so this is the, the concept that I use in looking at Achilles uh, in the Iliad. So the coming animal is the way for the losing watery to actually become more authentically who we are by this kind of transmutation of ourselves, specifically through connection with animals. Okay, it's a gigantic quote, and I'm going to read the entire quote, but just in case somebody was going to fact check me on this and wanted to, you know, wanted a citation here. Um, this just gives, you know, you see I've got a couple of the key terms here. So Deleuze and Guattari talk specifically about how becoming animal is actually becoming predatory, becoming warlike, uh, an involvement with beastly, ghastly practices. Um, and they talk a lot about Vikings, they also talk about people like Greek warriors, like Achilles, um, who are trying to transform themselves into the, the kind of battlefield rage, the rage of the berserker, which happens in and through becoming wolf-like, bear-like, wild cat like um, So all of this they, they call a single furor, they connect it with bacteria sowing contagion, that's a, another parasitic uh, reference that I quite like. Um, so it's this, uh, this way of thinking about the war machine, uh, the, the hunting machine, all of this as a kind of becoming animal, um, which I think is actually what we see going on with Achilles in the Iliad. Now, 
this again, I'm not going to read you the whole quote here, but so this is this is Richmond Lattimore's translation, by the way, if you're interested. So it's from book 20. This is the, the kind of big Achilles goes back to the fight um, scene. Um, so I should have a picture of Brad Pitt here, I guess, from that terrible <laughs> Peterson movie, um, Troy. Um, but if you know anything about the Iliad, you will know that there is a constant um, evocation through Homer's similes of predatory animals and the way that that, that that relates to describes what it is to be a warrior on the battlefield. So this is just one example. This is the, the big lion simile, as it's known. But it's not called the big lion simile. Anyway, it's the famous <laughs> lion simile. I get this call it the big lion simile. Um, no, it is, it's a quite well-known um, lion simile. Uh, in book 10, uh, sorry, book 20. So, okay, so here is an, so here is a becoming animal of Achilles. Uh, there are a couple of other quotes here. Achilles, in the first quote, this is when he's actually talking to Hector, and Achilles describes himself as a lion. He says, Hector, you're trying to make a deal with me. We're not going to make a deal because just as there are no contracts between men and lions, so I am not going to make a contract with you. Uh, and it's, it's himself as a lion uh, that he is talking through here. Um, this again connects with this uh, quotation from Deleuze and Guattari, so it's, sorry, TP is the Thousand Plateaus. Um, this becoming where, uh, in the quotation from the aggregate, thus composed with a canine, it's leonine in this uh, specific quotation uh, set of similes. And the, the final quotation here, so Achilles wants to cannibalize Hector. He doesn't actually in the text, but he he envisions himself, he wants to be that predator, right? He's, he's trying to actually inhabit that space and that way of being in the world that is that predatory, um, you know, that, that, that way of consuming uh, your prey. Um, so, what I, what I do with this is to say most thinkers who look at Achilles in the Iliad want to steer away from these kind of passages. So they want to see Achilles as philosophical or heroic for a variety of reasons, basically learning how to tame his anger and how to be a better warrior. It's, it's basically the story of Maverick and Top Gun, right? He's, he's too, I'm glad I got a laugh from that, but I'm serious. Um, so it's, he's too aggro, right? He's, he's too aggressive at the beginning and he has to learn how to be courageous, but still within limits. It, it is Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Um, that's what many people essentially see as the, the virtues of Achilles, right? It's, this is learning how to be a particular kind of courageous human being, and that's the kind of foundational text of Western civilization. Okay, I think that's bullshit. I think that it's actually these moments where Achilles is at his worst, what many people think of as at his worst, where he wants to be a cannibal, where he wants to eat Hector, where he is lion, and he wants to think of himself as a lion. Um, most everyone else wants to say no, that, especially if we don't want to double down on In fact, I think we should double down on that. Um, I think this is, this is Achilles, and Achilles as an avatar of the war machine, and it is where he is at his most powerful. The Iliad basically, as a text, teaches us, I think, that the the uh, apex of human virtue is to be a predatory lion who devours its prey, his or her prey. That's what it is to be human. What it is to be human, and you can't get better for Homer, you can't get better as a human being than wanting to consume raw your opponents. I think that is what the text actually says on its face, really. And most people uh, want to um, expunge that or, or see that as, uh, as the, the, uh, the problem. So I think what this shows, so, and that's the way that we see these warriors at their most powerful throughout the text, we see that it's tapping into that becoming. It's that predatory becoming that is the source of Achilles' power. And we can think of that, or I want to think of that as a kind of toolbox or a technology or a killer app. So it's tying into the becoming that is the root of the power. And it's power that I'm interested in for thinking about how to challenge the Anthropocene. Um, I don't think Homer intended this. I don't care that Homer didn't intend this. The, the question is completely irrelevant to me. Um, but there may be some textual purists here. Oh, by that. 
I mean, I say that I don't think he intended it or, or that uh, I don't care about it, even though I think it is actually in the text on its face. So I think both of those are true. Um, but what I primarily am concerned with is not, you know, divining Homer's intentions or why he put this uh, in the text, as I am interested in how to actually use this text to help us today, to help us in, in a, a civilizational crisis. So I'm not interested in uh, the moral lessons that are to be drawn, per se. Um, it's some kind of revolution, political, intellectual, whatever, that we are actually in need of. And I've got another long tech uh, quotation. I'm not going to read the, the quotation. Um, Hart and Nagri, Antonio Nagri and Michael Hart, two scholars inspired by Deleuze and Guattari and, and many other folks. Um, they wrote a three-part um, work, Empire, Commonwealth, and Multitude, which is basically about how to take power back from, um, from the hegemonic institutions of our day. Um, and for them, <clears throat> ultimately, Revolution is not for the faint of heart, right? It is a transformative process in which, in order to get the revolution that we probably need, the revolution that we want, we have to think about the sacrifice of our identity as we have uh, become attached to it. We have to turn ourselves into monsters. This is, I think, what we see, what we saw going on so long ago in the Iliad, and what I think we can tap back into. Um, and to make Achilles speak for us, in or at least for me, in challenging the Anthropocene. So I think, it, this, I think this is essentially talking about what uh, is going on in Achilles. OK, let me wrap up. So one of the useful things, I think, about this is about this uh, interpretive parasitism is, and I have a version that I want to call prophetic parasitism. Um, but I think it nicely, this, this goes back to tomorrow when we were talking about our discussions about ethical veganism and our, our debates, uh, although I'm still an ethical vegan, but I do think that the time is not a good time for a politics of purity. So instead of thinking about only using pure, nonviolent means, uh, you know, where we, you know, we make sure that we're never instrumentalizing others. We're always being the most careful. Sort of learning a kind of simplified lesson, let's say, from the, from Martin Luther King's um, writings in the Civil Rights Movement. By the way, I don't think Martin Luther King actually says this, but there's a there's a popular version of Martin Luther King that goes along with this pop politics of purity. Um, I think we we can and we should give up that. So um, the the time is. It's, it's past time to um, get our hands dirty. And there's no way around that. Um, it's an ultimate weapon of the weak. So parasitism, and even Franz Fanon used parasitic viral imagery to think about, um, to think about the post-colonial, the anti-colonial uh, revolution, um, talking about, um, talking about um, folks that's uh, in infection or uh, an invasion. Uh, Europe, um, you know, I think that's basically what we are talking about. We, we are in a situation of basic weakness against um, the, the prevailing hegemonic forces you know, that, that are steering, that, you know, climate change and extinction crises, etc. Um, so we're in a position of weakness. So we need a weapon for the weak. So that's Jane Scott's term, of course, in, in that text. Um, and I think that instead of denouncing parasitism, so there's a way that frequently in critiques of industrialized agricultural civilization, people are inclined to say human beings are parasites and that that's the problem, that human beings have parasitized the environment. And so from that standpoint, um, embracing parasitism seems kind of a strange move. And it, it is probably a strange move, but I think what we need is not to uh, kind of politics of purity that eliminates parasitism or that says that, that this is an impure method and so that we should, we, we should not engage in this kind of thing. But in fact, I think it needs to be cultivated as a strategy. So cultivating impure means, uh, 
um, be violent means um, I'm performing a variety of violent moves in terms of my textual interpretation. I mean, I'm not saying it, it's there's a certain kind of violence to the to the work that I'm doing. I'm not saying like I'm actually harming anybody in terms of how I'm interpreting play. Or I don't know, maybe some maybe some maybe some emotionally harmed by what I'm doing play. But um, but anyway, but there there is a kind of violence to that that interpretation, and I think cultivating parasitic methods, whether it's in terms of interrogating text and interpreting text, or whether it's in terms of it actually mobilizing sort of out in the world, the non-text world, um, I think um, this is basically the, the move that we need to make. Um, so Alien had it right all along. Um, again, just going back, hopefully this makes a little more sense now than at the beginning. So post-humanism is the parasite. Uh, the ancient texts are like the DNA of, of the host, uh, and then the Anthropocene is the host that I would like to explode from within. Hopefully that makes a little more sense now that I've gone through all this, but maybe not, we'll see. Um, okay, so let me just uh, pose a couple of possible questions that you may want to ask. Not that you'll have your own questions, but I just wanted to know. I, I can see a, a couple of possible responses. Um, one, you might say, this seems like interpretive uh, anarchy and relativism, and are you just saying that things from the past just mean whatever the hell you say they mean, and like, what about historical truth? So maybe you want to raise a complaint on that ground, cool. Um, maybe I should be paying royalties to Foucault because I'm ripping off his genealogical method, parody, dissociation, and the sacrifice of the subject. That's basically what I've been doing. I just didn't thematize it. Um, and the Xeno Feminist Collective, I don't know if any of you know about them, but there's amazing work, Helen Hester has a book on uh, Xeno Feminism, um, so I probably shouldn't be paying royalties to them. Um, and then the, the final question uh, is just a wonder about, and I was just talking about this on the, the last slide, you know, you might say, look, if you want to challenge anthropocentric civilization, isn't parasitism really the worst thing that you could pick, right? Isn't, isn't the problem with anthropocentric civilization that it is parasitic, and so why would one use parasitism to challenge parasitism? Um, one just little piece of this would be Marx, for instance, if you think capitalism has anything to do with the problem, Marx is tireless in his association of capitalism with vampirism and parasitism, right? So this is the, so if you come from a Marxist background, you're gonna say parasitism is totally bad because this is the way Marx presents it. Capitalism has parasitism. So, so you might be concerned there. You also might take uh, a page from Audre Lorde's book, The Master's Tools Cannot Burn Down the Master's House, right? I think that's wrong, but you, you, know, you, you may want to argue back with me, so that's cool. But I think The Master's Tools are really good for smashing the Master's House. I don't see any problem with that. Um, there, there are problems, but I don't think as a fundamental strategy that there's any problem at all. In fact, in fact I think most of the time that you're going to burn down a house, you probably need to use some of the tools that were used in building it. That tends to be the way things work. Um, so, that's me. I'm done. So, thank you so much. Okay, so, um, we're open to questions. Stefan is open for questions. I'm good. Um, and just speak up so that everyone's oh, there's here. A... Oh, there's a mic. Kay is going to run a mic around for folks who need it. Um, um, so, And, and can I say, just before you uh, ask a question, I really do, I, I welcome, if you want to tell me I'm full of pushback, that's fine. Like, I, I, you know, push back on me as much as you want. Uh, and maybe you probably would do that anyway, but, you know, hopefully you've had this impression from the way I'm presenting this that, you know, I welcome, you know, agonistic, contestatory questions and, and non-agonistic too, so. Anyway, yeah, okay. So, I was kind of wondering, uh, whether or if there is sort of a fine line or a big blurry gray area between like this kind of revolution against anthropocentrism and like total Hobbesian dog eat dog anarchy, I suppose, is my thing. Like, I don't know, it just a slippery slope argument came to mind. And I don't know if I would make that argument per se, but it just it did come to mind while we were speaking. So, okay. So you're saying some people are saying that there could be a problem with a gray line. You don't want to say that, but some people are. Yeah. Now, uh, so I guess your, 
you're thinking of the, the, the sort of revolutionary, like if there was a, little, a literal political revolution, is that what you're thinking? So in the kind of messiness that can occur then, or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So, or, or if you're thinking more in terms of interpretive anarchism, if that was your worry, or but you're thinking of like? More literal. Yeah, yeah, okay, no, good, yeah. Um, I mean, so, yeah, that's always a danger. But I think that the situation that we are in is, it's not as if we are in a nonviolent world situation today. In fact, it's anarchic and, and violent and brutal in all kinds of places. It's just that mainly in places like here, we're, we're protected from that, right? Um, so if, if the alternative were like a truly placid, peaceful world order versus what I'm proposing, then I guess I would, I would go farther with that worry. But we are, we are in such a fundamentally violent world situation. Uh, and that's, okay, so that's the violence of analog culture for one thing. So for many folks who are humanists, they're just gonna say, well, that doesn't count anyway. But I am gonna count that, and so that's the move I'm gonna make. But even if you're not talking about that, you're talking about, you're talking about the, the sixth grade extinction, and you're talking about the myriad um, you know, terrible spillover effects of climate change, and, and then just the current brutalities of a uh, neoliberal global order, right, that is, that is good for some people in some areas, and it's also really bad for many people. I'm not saying it's, it's horrible for everyone everywhere, but um, so I guess given, I, I don't think the alternative is all that great at the moment, so I, I'm, I, I'm not worried that there's going to be some blood spilled, you know, because there's already been, there's already blood being spilled. So there, there's no there's no you know order where that is not occurring. So I, I guess I always go back to um, the Marxist uh, philosopher Maurice Miller Ponty, who says the question is not is there a violent order versus a nonviolent order that we can think of. It's are you going to put the violence that the order is doing to good use or not. That's that's the only question. That's the main question, and so I agree with him and that, and so I want good violence, not bad violence. So. You're 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 gonna. You're yeah, gonna, no, I'll, uh, yeah, sure, okay, I'll um, baseline and then Leon. Yeah, I'll just I can shout if you want. Yeah, Come shout out. it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, with the recording? No. Yeah, uh, it's okay because we're not recording the Q and A. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. yeah. It's off the record. It's okay. off the record. Okay. Okay. Good. So it's only the live yeah. tweeting. Yeah, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the reason that we have the mic is in case somebody needs it for hearing accessibility. Mm -hmm. So it's important, um, I guess, if, it, if, if somebody needs it, let us know and we'll use the mic. Otherwise, you can. Yeah, we do. Okay, um, screen. All right. Well, okay. great. Yeah. Um, I guess I also, you, I probably, I know coming in late, I probably missed some of the definitional things, but I guess I was curious. Um, more specifically what you mean by good violence? Is this um, just the disassembly inherent in reassembly? Um, or is this, you know, in a very interpretive theoretical scale or even maybe more literally what you mean, but I don't really want to get caught up in mm -hmm. the literal in this sense. I was kind of just curious what maybe a little bit more specifically you mean by good violence. Right. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, and I, I didn't say, right, I didn't, I didn't okay. specify that, so you missed that. Um, can I ask, I, I, let, oh. me, let me tag on to that, which okay. is, I'm worried that you've just given my students a license to, <laughs> as you say, you know, just like, read whatever they want, <laughs> and say, therefore, you know, so here's a way to, can you, is there something, do these texts help us answer the good, bad violence question? in a reliable way, or is that just like... Yeah, it's where you turn for distinguishing between the two. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's, I was gonna say you're parasitizing her question. Yeah, Which you kind totally. of did, which, is, did which is fine. But then, right. but you, you, you connected it more faithfully with what yeah. you're saying. But yeah, okay. Oh yeah, no, 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 I was being faithful. You were being what? I, I was being totally faithful. Yeah, right. I am right, faithful right. to my students. Right. Except and when they... They're 
questions and their interpretations are all precious little creatures and birds and things that we have to not you, you're not precious. No, no, your 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 ideas are precious little creatures. Um, okay. Um, so I guess I, I do think these texts do give us um, I guess more in well, I think in both Plato and Homer, and even in Aristotle, I do think all of them give us an indication that ethics needs to, and the idea of good and bad, and what whether it's a, whether the treatment of something matters, matters across species lines. So they have a much more cosmological perspective than I think is often attributed to them. Um, so I do think these texts, so I guess to your question, I do think text themselves, and so it would be more in the Plato stuff, which I, which I only gestured at, but more in Plato where we see the, the way that souls and sensations uh, sort of transcend the human, so that we, we have all these kind of connections. So we're, 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 our lives are in connection with all kinds of other lives that are not human, and that we have all kinds of exemplars for how to behave that are also non human. So, there is a, a more capacious notion of what doing justice or doing good in the world would be, and, it's, and it really has to extend beyond human boundaries. Um, so I think we do see that in these texts, although not necessarily in sets of like dogmatic rules, do, you know, do business, this. But I think that, so for me, I guess from this, I take it, but it's not that these, these texts are not the only place that I get this, right? Um, but doing violence that is uh, in the service of creating a world in which more of us can be at home with, with, with other kinds of creatures who seem quite strange to us and have been traditionally defined as not relevant things or property or just, well, you know, basically either as things or property or as just nothing not counting rather than as persons, which has been traditionally uh, restricted to the human. Although, of course, in all kinds of indigenous cosmologies, personhood is extended across the, the human, non human boundaries. So, I'm, I am talking about the, again, the sort of Western texts and, and the way they have been thought to construct personhood as something that's only human, not non human. Um, but, so yeah, I, I think for me, good violence is. Is creating uh, more space for us to be at home in these interconnections across species lines. And I, I think that good violence is, at the end of the day, about being more um, careful towards all kinds of other living creatures. But I think in order to do that, one can't abjure or totally give up on violence. J just, as, just as there's no there's no police order in the world today that claims to protect life and all of its fundamentals that does not carry weapons, right? There's no, there's no police force, there's no country that does not have a police force and military, and all of them claim to protect and uphold human rights, but they are also going to not allow certain things in, in a quite dramatic fashion. Um, I think that's as true of trying to change the ethnocentric order that we are in as it is of thinking about what a current nation state does. You can't just say, Great, continue on with the present order, I think. Um, yeah, so I guess I realize this might be a, kind of towing the line of getting into the practical, which might be bad for some reason, but uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> so how do you think that the like radical reinterpretation of the like fundamental or foundational documents of society of Plato or Aristotle, the Constitution, uh, like would affect people when they're like the scope of most members of society's knowledge of like Plato is pretty limited. So, like using those, uh, reinterpreting those foundational documents would uh, really like change kind of like the system. And then, how would the system kind of like work that change down to like across other levels of society? Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's true. Most people don't have you know Plato. Or Side. They're, they're not the Republic at night. Um, 
I do think that, yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a limit in some sense, I guess, to, to how directly I see this working the change, but I do think that, I guess I'll use the, neg the, the negative example of the, the Trump Sparta folks, right? Um, I do think that, it, it, I do think that it matters that those folks can look at these texts and that there is a tradition of interpretation that they can fall back on to say, my God, no, this is who we are, and it's all about being a, a you know, basically badass Achilles. That's what it is to be a man. That's what it is to, to you know, to live your life and, and to, to sort of just to, to be a, a good person, but also that's where they get the kind of, um, like there's the emotional tie there. It's like the, the kind of, um, you know, this is like, this is like what, what it is to, you know, what it is to be who I am is to be this person who will, you know, throw down when I, you know, to stand up and defend what I need to defend, whatever. And I think it matters that, that they, or they're using these unsophisticated interpretations, but it matters that they're able to tap into that. And so I think as a sort of counter-programming, we want to have alternative stories. And rather than saying your old texts are meaningless, it's, it's more useful to actually say, no, actually, they mean something different. So my example for this is, uh, there are a lot of examples that you could use, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, the women's suffrage movement and the reinterpretation of the Declaration of Independence. This is a perfect example, I think. So when, when the suffragettes said, hey, the Declaration of Independence, when they said in 1848, the Central Falls Declaration, the Declaration of Independence actually included women. Like, all men are created equal applies to women. Well, that was false as a historical claim. It didn't, and most everyone did not think that it applied to women. There were you know, a couple of people who did at the time. And shout out to New Jersey. New Jersey allowed women to vote for 20 years, uh, it, it enfranchised women for 20 years after the American Revolution. Most everyone forgets this, it's 1805, 1806, but, but that was ended. Um, but that exception. Um, but it was, it was a radical reinterpretation to say that that text that you all love actually means this other thing. Men actually includes women, even though nobody back then knew it, and most of you all right now don't know it. And it's now a common, most people I think now would say, well, of course, even though it says men, they really meant women. They, like, this has become cultural common sense in the United States. But it took 70 years of political mobilizing and arguing uh, to, to make that change. But it actually worked, right? And even in 1920, I don't know how many people would have actually believed that, but certainly now the way that Declaration of Independence is taught, but it's, taught, it's well, it, it is in it, but yeah, it's like it means everybody. Um, similarly, Frederick Douglass uh, and others they interpret the Declaration you know, to apply to slaves. Many, of course, you know, that also was kind of historically inaccurate in some sense, but you know, that interpretation that was for a long time becomes the hegemonic one. So and, and it's important now for people, for instance, who are not just feminists, but just um, de you know, defenders of equality for women, it's important that they're able to say now, and it's just something that you can just say as a, uh, uh, as a bit of common culture, you can say, well, the Declaration is about women. Like, it's all men are created equal, but that, you know, that applies to women as well. Um, and it's just, it can be used in arguments now as if it's just a fact that it applies to everybody. But that's a new fact. That's a fact that was created after 1848. It is not an actual fact of the text and at its time of the Declaration of Independence. So, but it's important now that, you know, that women, uh, and, and again, anyone who's interested in women's equality can just say and appeal to this as if it's a fact, when in fact it's a constructive fact. So that's a long way of question. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a quick change. But, um, but it's important in actually changing a civilization in order to, in order to rework it, you have to rework its foundational texts. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, one thing that inspired me was your discussion of Bible and and like learning from non human creatures and like, how we create politics. And it reminded me of um, Donna Haraway's recent book, Stay with the Trouble. Yep, I'm just and teaching that in my, oh. in my graduate center. So yeah. yeah, that's kind of my question.
question, like how you relate your work to like all this feminism and um, practical activism and like ways that people are thinking about creating connections with non-human beings um, in a more, I guess, like more contemporary political systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for that question. So I could have said I could have put her I could have cited heroin more specifically, and she has been important in the project and the xenofem. She's not technically a xenofeminist, but yeah, I should I should have put her in there. Um, yeah. So yes to connecting with multi-species ethnography, with feminist new materialists, uh, or with just new materialists in general, like Jane Bennett, um, who talk about distributed agency, thinking about humans is not solely the sources of agency or semi-autonomy in the world, and in fact agency is distributed across all kinds of organic and inorganic um, compounds and creatures of human cosmos. Um, so the, one of the specific ways, and I, I do this more in an essay about, um, uh, about the Iliad, is trying to think about animal activists and what they could or could not do what they stop themselves from doing in terms of engaging in more direct action, more disruptive action, more even violent action. So for me, um, thinking about doing more direct confrontational activism uh, in the service of uh, you know, assailing um, animal agriculture, animal exploitation, uh, is one of the lessons I try to draw out from Achilles uh, in the Iliad. So, is becoming an animal and allowing oneself as an activist to dwell a little bit more with your rage, uh, for one thing, uh, and allowing that to sort of transmogrify to, to do some kind of an alchemy with you so that you're willing to maybe do more and give up more instead of the kind of comfortable bourgeois activism of many animal activists where it's like, well, you go to the protest and then you know you go home and cook your dinner and you know, pick up the kids from school. Um, so I think that unleashing some of that power, one way to do that is through you know, this, this really epic approach to it. So it's, it's, it would be like a different way to think about, I guess the simple way of saying it is, many animal activists want to think about themselves as a little more African juniors. And maybe what I want them is more like Malcolm but even like a more extreme, so like Achilles. Um, and again, I'm not saying that School in uh, the civil rights movement, you'll say, you'll know that actually King was not uh, not the king that I'm making him out to be, but there's a version of King that says that it's like this sort of very pure, you know, quiet. That there's a there's a co-opting of King that is going on, and so that's the it's the co-opting of King as a as a lesson for animal activists that I'm pushing back um, by using it. Seems like what you've articulated here is simply the universal tactic for establishing ideology. Uh, so my example could be um, the establishment of the state of Israel, for example, which is based on uh, biblical mythology and um, uh, books like From Time Immemorial to um, whitewash and erase the genocide of Palestinians in order to clear the land, so to speak, so that Israel could exist. And it seems to me like um, what is differentiating your point of view here from that point of view? Um, so I, I don't have, I guess, an ethical, I don't have a series of thou shalt nots in this. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I, I think the sort of the devil is in the details in terms of what what fantasies one engages in or what myths one constructs. So I, I so I guess I want to say I don't think it's my job to say like here are the specific criteria for like when to use a good you know when to mythologize and when not to. I think that but in general and going back to when I was talking about what I want to call my version of parasitism as a kind of prophetic parasitism in terms of in terms of looking at forward in the kind of future-orientedness that I want this parasitism to have, and 
in the way that I think it has to be connected toward seeing ourselves as always in a greater, in terms of pluralizing our relationality, in terms of creating more connections with other living beings. Uh, I mean, in general, I would say that, you know, in the service of, you know, genocides are not going to be in the service of that, right, uh, um, and radical displacement. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of inbuilt rules. It's certainly the case that, um, yeah, there are a lot of different ways that one could go with this kind of general approach. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's also important to take account of the utility of political mythologizing and to not shy away from it in the, in the, in the quest to only be true about history or what have you. So in other words, if the, so what I would say is if the Palestinians, in, in terms of this particular case, are able to construct a completely fantastic and fictitious narrative about their own history, uh, but it was useful in countering the Israeli genocide, I would say go, go for it. I, like, I don't care that it's not true. It makes no difference to me. Or at least it doesn't make a lot of difference. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I might just be So, that's a, she's a good question. I, um, so, I, it's, that is probably my least favorite kind of Arendt text, and so I'm, I'm going to argue with Arendt through, or argue with you through uh, Arendt. Um, so, I think Arendt, okay, so in my view, I think Arendt actually embraces all kinds of things that are actually violent, but because she uses conceptual sleight of hand, she defines violence in this very limited way. But all kinds of things that occur under action are, in my view, actually violent, but she doesn't define them as violence. So, um, so I think, it, so, I guess certain forms of, and I, and I actually don't remember all the details of, of her characterization of, of violence, but I would say, I guess I, I want to say that I think that by having a more honest discussion of violence, that it it's helpful it's helpful for us to acknowledge when we are doing violent things and not try to define them away by slipping them into some other category and then creating a zone or creating a category for violence, which is a very limited amount of things, and then we can say, oh, well, we, we don't want to do that, so we are nonviolent because we don't do this small subset of things. And so I think actually aren't is, I don't want to accuse her of being naive, she certainly is not, but, um, and I don't remember my sense of being naive by using our, but I think that there's a kind of politics of purity that Ari is engaging in through her purification of concepts and the way that she, a number of the things that actually occur under action, which are violent, but she sees them because it's about, you know, sort of popular power, um, it, it doesn't, but I guess, okay, this is where I, I say now that maybe I'm, I should have said at the beginning, but it may be that my memory of this is not as clear as it should be. So I may be doing conceptual sleight of hand in my response to you because you've read the text more recently than I have. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to riff on this question and also call, we, we need to, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the last question, question. Actually, no, I'm going to open it. Is there any last question that anybody wants to ask before I ask the next question? Which will connect the name and that. OK, so. Well, I hope your question's a good one. It's no, it's not important. that interesting. And it actually, I think it reiterates a lot of what we've been asking about. Um, so Arendt is famous for being a terrible reader of, for instance, Aristotle. Like, don't ever trust if you don't go to er, to a rent for your Aristotle because, yeah. and I, or your Plato. Nonetheless, and she even admits it at some point. But she says, "Look, I'm using them for my purposes," which sounds a lot like what you were saying. And and I mean, I could go back to Aeson's but but I guess my I mean, one, I wanted to hear again. Like, so are you giving my students permission to, act, to use the text, however? Is there any interpretive limit, uh, yeah. A? And B, again, to connect it, like, is there something in these texts that can help us think through? Um, or maybe why should we, why, it, it, is there any text that we should trust more to help us think through the question of good or bad violence? Almost all sort of traditional canonical text with with additions from contemporary scholars, mostly. Yeah. Okay. So. And you can you can give a short version of the answer, but I have sure. a long question. So I would say that I think the um, well, I think as the I think the question of, no, I think the simple answer is no, I don't think there are any limits. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of interpretation, the question, so th there are two gigantic schools of thought in French post-structuralism. There's this sort of Derrida side, and I'm going to say this is more true of thought in general. There's this sort of Derrida side, which is like all about meaning, significance, and how you get to it, and the kind of infinite reinterpretations about meaning. There's the Foucault and Deleuze side, which is we don't care, meaning and significance are not relevant. The question is, what can you do? The question is, what can you produce with these things? So plug them in and create. And so that is the side that I am on. I am on the take the text and create something, do something in the world. And if your interpretation allows you to do something, then wonderful. Now, you do need to learn some of the codes, some of the some some basics for the way these texts speak uh, to their readers at the time, um, and, and you know what it means to sort of craft an argument and that sort of thing. Like what what are some of the basic ways that the texts maybe sort of make sense on their own? But I think that's only as a jump off point to figure out how to something else with these texts. You can learn how to argue from these texts. In other words, there may not be substance that you want us to see, yeah, yeah. but you can at least learn to make an argument of some sort. Yeah, yeah probably marshal the text to uh, like, do what you want. Yeah, that's the bad But yeah, Well, yes, but I think, but also, so Margaret Leslie and her piece She talks about the way that Gramsci um, basically looks at Machiavelli's prints and creates something kind of totally new through basically a kind of crazy reinterpretation of Machiavelli. The fact that it's not well, the fact that it's not faithful to its antecedent is kind of irrelevant. It's it's a, it's a creation of new political action, which in a way, a new political acts, which in a way is kind of faithful to Machiavelli, but it's not faithful in any very narrow way. Um, and so. It's again about what can you do in the world with these texts, and I don't even know if it's, I don't know, it's something about, I don't even know that the texts help that much with understanding like how arguments work or how to make a good argument. I'm not sure that they do. 
Because I'm, I'm not sure that I care about making arguments. Mm. Which, uh, again, that was a good thing to know at the beginning of this, this speech. This talk is not about an argument. This talk, this talk, it's like Seinfeld. Like, there's, there's, this is a talk about nothing. Um, this is a this is, an this, is a, this is a talk about an argument. Why didn't you say that when we could put that on the poster? I should have. I should have. Yes. All right. Well, we're we're gonna have to continue this conversation tomorrow in class. I can because I can see that all this feedback. I